atomic energy can be useful and beneficial and life-saving, but they can also be health damaging. So there is a, re a region where there is a potential for conflict, and that is particularly true when it comes to nuclear power. But radiation, as we know, is in, in, enormously powerful in medicine. And for WHO to have the technical support from the IAEA is really uh, extremely important. So I want to just look at a couple of examples of where this comes into play. If you deliver a uh, cancer therapy type machine, a charged particle generator, to an undeveloped country which doesn't have a high level of techniques in physics and engineering. That's a lethal, potentially lethal piece of equipment if it's used wrong. It happens even in uh, uh, much more highly developed countries we occasionally get overexposure of patients. But equally, it's not a good idea to underexpose patients because you don't get the full effect, you just get the bad side effects of the radiation, you don't get the full uh, curative effects of it. So IAEA keeps that expertise on dosimetry, and WHO does not have that. So that's one area where the two organizations should work together. Much the same goes for the small sources that are used in treatment and diagnosis. Again, in the less developed world, uh, I don't know the dangers associated with these. Many of these sources get lost or uh, abused, and it is the responsibility, it is in fact the mandate of the IAEA to make sure that those sources are used properly. So in these areas, there's a lot in this book which is beneficial to the WHO. But for nuclear power, the problem is different. The IEA claims, and I don't think they do this really honestly, that they don't promote nuclear power. They only assist those who want it, and they try to ensure that use is not made of these reactors to produce weapons. And this is the reason why they're in the security camps, because of the weapons connection in their work. Now I say this is disingenuous, it's not really truthful, not because probably they mean it, but because the people that are attracted to work for an organization like IAEA have a particular outlook about atomic energy and nuclear power. And this inevitably skews the views of the organization of a ho as a whole. So, we can't pin that down to any piece of paper or document or anything, it's just a fact of life. And so we have to take a little look at the brain and the way it works, because I think it's relevant. So for evolutionary reasons, memory is handled in the brain as a structural rather than a functional thing. The brain is structured to create memories. It's not like software on the computer. It's in the hard wiring of the, of the brain, where we keep the memory. And that is important for survival, because if you learn something useful, then it's a good idea not to be able to forget it. And so giving memory some kind of permanence is proved to be uh, an evolutionary advantage, and it's therefore been selected. Now, if you go back to the 1950s, when I was uh, at school and uh, about to go to university, nuclear power was presented to the world as the answer to everything. Energy would be so cheap that you wouldn't even need to meter it. And that, in fact, was the case in the former Soviet Union, or at least in some parts of it. So this was sold to uh, a generation, really, of young people uh, with the desire to go out and do some good. And this looked to many of them that this would be a good way to go. But of course this was a, not a truthful um, 
selling of this idea on the part of the uh, of governments. Because many UN member states, for example, the UK, the United States, France, they wanted to get fuel, uh, uh, fuel for their weapons. They wanted plutonium. And so they ran civil nuclear power programs in order to generate plutonium. It was denied repeatedly in the United Kingdom throughout the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, until finally it was agreed, well, yes, that's what they'd been doing, and they now had 100 tons of the stuff, and they didn't know what to do with it, uh, because they had as many weapons as they needed. So the latest proposal is that it's put into fuel, into this MOX fuel, and burned in reactors. Now this is what I call Generation A, a pro-nuclear generation. But in 1979 and 86, as you know, we saw two accidents, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. And then it was, became clear that if you looked at it rationally, this was a very dangerous kind of technology. And many, many people saw that. And for example, in Italy, nuclear uh, power program was shut down completely. And that became well implanted into brains because this is really an issue of survival. But there was a downside to that because few reactors were built over this period since Chernobyl at least and now competent nuclear engineers, physicists are in short supply because there was no industry to employ them, nobody to pay them, so people didn't study that at university. And I believe that lack of competence that has resulted from that was really partly what we saw at Fukushima. But then again, in 2000, we had the increased awareness about global climate change. And nuclear power was seen by the remaining members of Generation A, the pro-nuclear people, this was the answer. It wouldn't be cheap, but it would be low carbon. And I think that even that is stretching things quite a lot. So they have tried to downplay the consequences of the, act uh, of the uh, accident in order to try and achieve a renaissance of nuclear power. And they've won over some rather surprising people. George Monbiot, for many uh, um, years has been a very uh, anti-nuclear, very green uh, journalist. Suddenly, about two weeks ago, he had a conversion, and now he is uh, a pro-nuclear advocate of, of the First Order. And a few years ago, that happened to Lovelock, the, uh, the guy, guy. So, you can switch this hard wiring, and not all of us, of course, have it. I mean, some of us still try and remain rational about these things and look at the advantages and disadvantages. But there are some that don't. So we have two sides in this argument and very little in the middle. Very, very little in the middle. And each side thinks the other's ideas are irrational or ridiculous. I just want to look at something which was actually a little bit of good news because around 1980 the future for nuclear power was to be fast breeder reactors. But one Italian physicist, Giancarlo Pinchera, he noticed that there was a very fundamental uh, uh, issue with these, that they were inherently unsafe. And he presented this paper at a conference, and the upshot, apart from the complete wrecking of his career, was that the fast breeder program was terminated. And now we have hardly any fast breeder reactors left. I, I met him uh, around the beginning of the, the 90s. And he said to me, beware the dying kick of the nuclear advocates. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we're seeing this now, but maybe they're not dying. I don't know. It's too early to say. Fukushima surely will have a big impact on the nuclear debate, but exactly what it will be, we don't know. So we have two resolutely opposed views 
one of them in the IEA, and for the most part, I think people in the WHO are not um, resolutely opposed to nuclear power, but they're certainly not resolutely in favour of it, most of them, at least at the technical level. That may not be true at the political level. So I want to give you an example of work that was done, I was involved in it, um, which was to prepare the uh, WHO's guidelines on iodine prophylaxis. And I want to start at the bottom, at the level at which technical people cooperate together. But I want to remind you once again that it's member states that pay the money, they call the shots. So the iodine prophylaxis guidelines were, uh, we saw the need after the Chernobyl accident to revise those and uh, we appointed uh, two consultants from Finland, Ben Paley and Leif Blomqvist, and we worked with Malcolm Crick, who was then working with the uh, IAEA. And by mid-1998, we had the first draft of the guidelines, and it was circulating in the two organizations at the management level. Now, we had cleared all we could foresee to be, it would be a disagreement um, with the managements of both organizations, and it looked as if we would go forward uh, and publish these guidelines in 1998. But suddenly, the IAEA withdrew. Uh, and they strongly advised WHO that the whole issue should be dropped. And we shouldn't bother anymore. The issue was the lowering of the 100 milligray dose to the thyroid for the child down to 10 milligray. Because Chernobyl showed us that children were much, much more sensitive to the effects of radioactive iodine than were adults. So there was a good, sound scientific reason for doing that. But in 1999, just the next year, the European Regional Office convinced WHO its headquarters in Geneva that WHO nevertheless should go ahead with the publication without the IAEA, which it did. The response of the IAEA was to announce that these guidelines were a draft. They were for consultation only, not to be implemented. And so we had the situation that the guidelines were out there with the member states and not being implemented. Uh, according to the IAEA, some of their member states regarded them as scientifically flawed, particularly in respect of the 10 milligray level. At that point, Geneva then refused to further defend the guidelines, but Euro maintained its position. They did not withdraw them. And the matter was resolved at a uh, technical meeting in 2001 in Vienna. It took four days, and eventually it emerged that France had persuaded the IAEA that they should oppose the publication of the guidelines. So here we have broadly outlined the situation at the bottom, at the technical level, good working relationship between the two organizations. When you get up to the political level, it is influenced directly from above by the member states, and in this case, France. So the agreement never entered the uh, debate at all. It wasn't pointed, it wasn't raised by IAEA, they didn't say that because of the agreement we couldn't do this. They were acting entirely and, I will say, dishonestly on the part of their, uh, one of their member states because they must have known that there was in fact no scientific basis to what was being claimed. 